Welcome to the DJE Podcast, where you will learn about real estate investing from real life examples. Here's your host, Devin Elder. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the show. Thank you for joining us today. My guest is Vasu Kakarlapudi. He's a physician based out of Louisville, Kentucky, and him and his wife are both professional real estate investors, as well as practicing uh, ear, nose, and throat and dentist, respectively, for him and his wife. And he shares his journey from uh, becoming a doctor, practicing, seeing the light on real estate, and then moving into multifamily real estate. So a lot of um, a lot of insight that he shares from the journey going through that. And we also talk about some some practical things like market selection, what they're doing in this current environment with the economy and rates where they are, uh, wh- how they structure their deals for investors, uh, all of that kind of tactical stuff we dive into as well. So uh, really, really extraordinary gentleman, very bright uh, uh, doctor, and I thoroughly enjoyed my conversation with him. I think you're going to enjoy it as well. Before we get into the episode, two quick notes. If you are not seeing deals from our firm, from DJE Texas, and you want to, you can go to djetexas.com, linked right here in the show notes, and you can sign up to uh, meet our team, see case studies, get on the list to see future projects, and basically get to know us, which is a great first step if you're considering investing in a project at some point in the future, that is the first step. Secondly, if you're interested in your own multifamily syndication business where you go out and buy apartment complexes as businesses and run them and you're the primary operator or team of general partner uh, on the team of the general partnership going out to operate these deals, we created apartmenteducators.com as an ecosystem to plug into that's going to fast track all this. So you've got mastermind coaching uh, you know, an education program that's structured. You've got the network to plug into in multiple markets all around the country. And that's going to accelerate your learning and your success in the multifamily world. We've got a free eight part video series for you at apartmenteducators.com that you can check out. Okay. Without further ado, let's get into the interview. Here we go. Doctor, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us on the podcast today. Uh, how are you? I'm doing great, Devin. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you. Uh, I want to get into, of course, the multifamily uh, ins and outs of your business, but obviously that's kind of current state of things. Before that, take us back. What, what's your background, uh, your professional background? And I'm always very curious to learn about the pivot point that folks that investors went through, right? Was there, was there an inflection point where you said, I can't do this anymore, or I'm inspired by this person to kind of take that path into, into real estate? Yeah, actually. Um, so I, I grew up in uh, Kansas city, a uh, son of two uh, Indian immigrants and uh, tried to play baseball when I was young. And uh, unfortunately uh, when I couldn't make the high school team, I r- realized that that wasn't going to earn a living for me. So I, uh, there were a lot of other Brown kids who did good in school in the Midwest uh, did and went into medicine uh, there, I kind of really fell in love with um, ear, nose, and throat surgery, uh, as it was kind of a, a good mix of young and old, and and being able to make a significant impact on a lot of people during their working working years, as opposed to people at the very beginning or end of life. Um, so I began practice uh, in Louisville or New Albany, Indiana, which is a suburb of Louisville, uh, back in two thousand and three, and. Um, you know, my wife and I, my wife's a dentist and she, we, we quickly realized that, you know, we had larger paychecks than we were when we were in residency and the students, but, uh, um, we were still trading time for money and much like a lot mm. of your other guests kind of made that realization that, you know, trading time for money is, is, has, <laughs> is not the most ideal way of doing this. And so we, you know, we were students of like successful people and, and realized that one of the common themes was, was real estate. Uh, and so we kind of dove deep in a um, long time ago uh, into, into real estate and kind of figured out, you know, that if this is, you know, if you could have, you know, just like Kiyosaki talks about, if you build up enough assets that generate income for you, then you can do your day job and what you went to school for, uh, for fun and for the passion of treating patients, which is kind of, you know, why we, most of us went into medicine and healthcare to help patients. And then with all this 
negativity and uh, negative secular trends in medicine, it's easy to get um, you know burdened by all the negativity. But whereas if you you know provide some passive income and um, so that you can do your job for fun, it all of a sudden becomes fun again. So that was our primary motivation for getting started. Outstanding. Um, and you still both practice today, you and your wife. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, um, not nearly as much as we used to. So my my wife much less than I do. Um, she's uh, almost full time doing real estate now, but uh, oh, I, I, I I do a little bit of both. I do uh, practice ENT surgery and real estate. Yeah, well, I mean, it's all about the option, right? I like to work really hard. I found that I'm happiest when I'm working really hard, but it's optional. But you know, it's an op it's a choice, and it's strange how that works. It's the same work. You know, yeah. it's the same showing up and, and working hard, but when it's optional, it kind of just takes on a different, different meaning. Uh, it brings a certain. lot more enjoyment to it, Devin. I mean, 100%, you, know, a, you, you get to do something rather than you have to do something. A absolutely. Yeah. Same task. And it's just, it's just a different, uh, different perspective on it for sure. What was your, what was your on-ramp? Was it, you know, the purple Bible that you alluded to? Was it a <laughs> seminar? Was it a, a business partner, a LP investment? You know, how did you kind of first get exposed to this stuff. I, I mean, I read all the same books that most of your audience has probably read. You know, I think Kiyosaki is, is, is going to be, you know, a, a common theme here. Obviously, we kind of, that was the first inkling. But then, you know, I'm, I'm a very, very risk averse person. And, um, you know, part of the meticulous nature of ENT surgery is that we're trained to like avoid risks and avoid pitfalls. And okay. so I knew that I did not want to just dive into this head first without, you know, without obtaining a appropriate amount of knowledge before, uh, first. So we kind of went to real estate school, really just read all these books and um, found mentors along the way. So, in, in, you know, for, for those in medicine or your audience, you know, we, in medical school, you, the first couple of years, you learn the basics of medical terminology and the basic science. The last two years, you, you follow other physicians and, and start seeing patients. And then you spend three to five, six years, you know, practicing with professors that do what you do. And so, you know, that, that was a path that was well known to me. And so I followed that same path into real estate, you know, we got, we got a basic education, um, found some mentors along the way. Ironically, some of them are my patients um, who I found out from real estate. And so, uh, <laughs> you know, talking to them and helping them with their ENT needs. And, you know, I was like, oh, you know, I heard you're doing real estate. Can I uh, can I come spend some time with you and learn how you do things? And can I, sure. I was used to that mentorship kind of mentality in medicine. And I basically just use the same process to learn about real estate and kind of see how they do things and being risk averse. I did not take any initial action until I felt, you know, super confident in what I was doing because, you know, part of our personality, both my wife and I is that, you know, we don't want to get into involved in anything until unless we're world class at it. So to be world class, at it, you, you don't get into that being world class at the beginning, you've got to have um, some basic education, then you've got some other people around you to uh, mentor you and, and, and help, uh, you know, vet all your decisions that you make. Yeah, that's great. I appreciate you shedding some light on that. And I'm, I'm sure compared to the, the path that you both went through, um, becoming doctors, you know, real estate by comparison. I mean, you know, there's some variables there, but it's pretty straightforward. You understand the debt, you understand the rents, you understand kind of how the, the loans and the equity work. Um, and it's just kind of getting exposed to that repeatedly. Did you guys toy around with a lot of different real estate avenues, short-term rentals, single family, this, this and that, or, or, or did you kind of get exposed to multifamily and, and go in that direction? No, we kind of chose multifamily now as a primary focus, um, more out of looking for a certain type of asset class that would provide um, the the vast um, an, an opportunity to get in on the on on the most risk averse asset class. So we didn't stumble upon multifamily initially. Uh, mm -hmm. Kind of did a lot of some single family, um, and then figured out that was hard to scale, and then. Um, part of what we transitioned to is um, to uh, other things that we knew. So we knew medical offices, right? So we knew sure. what we were doing with medical office. So we kind of went from single family um, to medical office. And uh, we actually built a surgical hospital, pooled a bunch of colleagues together that we could find a place that we could operate together and we could be owner occupied tenants, which really reduces your risk. So, um, so I really kind of cut my teeth into that space and then transitioned into, um, you know, grocery anchored retail 
as well on and working on multifamily parallel on a parallel track as well. So now we kind of mostly focus on multifamily because from a, from a syndication perspective, because um, uh, we can talk about this later, but as we evolved from, you know, uh, taking risks with our own money and learning all those hard lessons, uh, more and more people, our friends and colleagues wanted to get on board. And uh, for a lot of those folks, you know, they uh, are tr traditional stock and bond investors. And right. so their foray into commercial real estate uh, is probably best served with multifamily. And then once you kind of fill that base level, the lowest risk uh, bucket, then you can kind of move on to other asset classes within uh, commercial real estate. So um, we spend a lot of our time kind of helping um, our colleagues, you know, uh, learn a little bit more about the space and figure out kind of, you know, how they can get their feet wet and kind of hold, um, you know, guide them along the way, much like other people have, you know, helped us along the way. Our goal is to kind of pay that forward. Yeah, hundred percent. It seems to be a very common theme where you, and this is a similar process that I went through and obviously many others, but you kind of start with your own account, you know, yeah. and the worst case scenario is you lose hundred percent of your capital and, yeah. and that's uh, that's a survivable deal and, and you kind of move on. And I think after some period of experience and success there, you kind of want to share that with other folks. Were you guys in that mode of, of, learning and deploying your own capital and deals for a, a period of time or was that was that short or a longer period of time was that a, kind of a short deal before you kind of discovered the syndication world and scaled that out or what did that look like yeah we did that for 15 years on our own okay. so yeah, yeah great. <laughs> only, we've only been syndicating for a little less than two years right now mm -hmm. so um, we, we practiced on our own capital from, for a long time. Um, and then we had a few deals that we did with friends and family, my partners in my practice. Uh, mm -hmm. and we, we talked about that surgical hospital and I worked with a few other people on a limited basis, but, you know, really going, um, on a larger scale to a greater audience of peers has just really been after, after 15 years of solid experience of, um, you know, going through the school of hard knocks and, and picking, you know, picking up the pieces and, and learning from each of those events and um, figuring out how, how you could be better on each deal. Yeah, 100%. I mean, I, I would much rather invest as an LP with an operator that's had some bumps and bruises and been through uh, different different types of projects, uh, 100%. So within your profession, um, you've got high income and, and low time, right, for, for a lot of folks. So how did you go about connecting the dots with with other doctors um, and kind of explaining this business model to them, was there resistance? It was there a ton of education involved for, for these for these other prospective investors? Did they get it immediately? You know, how was that received once you started to shift to that syndication model? Yeah, I mean, I think you know our peers are very scientifically oriented, right? So, I mean, right. I think you know if you think about like if you show the data. Uh, of why real estate, and you, you know, you, you're well versed in this, and your audience is well versed in all the reasons why real estate's a great, uh, great tool to build and, and preserve wealth. Um, I find that there's really kind of two basic issues: is you know, a lot of people know that they should get involved in real estate, but there's really you know a, a gap of knowledge. Uh, and, a, and a gap of trust. And yes. so our entity is apt to properties, which is a, a Sanskrit word. Sanskrit's an old ancient, ancient Indian language mm -hmm. um, is really founded on trust. And that's, that's how we came up with the name apt to property. Okay, great. So we wanted to bridge that gap with our peers um, of knowledge and education about basic financial education and why diversification is important. Why, um, you know, one of the common pain points that a lot of our peers have is taxes. So people on that left side of the quadrant and either self-employed or employed folks, you know, taxes eat away at 30, 40, you know, sometimes marginally up to 50% of their income in certain states. And so, you know, if you, you know, if you lose that much of your income to taxes, um, that decreases your investable pool. But if you could uh, harness some of that and save some of, some of that capital and invest it in real estate and, and use the income uh, and, and create income that's tax deferred, uh, that provides a larger pool. So th those are just a simple example of how 
a little bit of education and knowledge about why real estate, what does it do for you? Um, how does it bring back some freedom? How does it you know, improve your quality of life? How does it allow you to spend more time with your family? Um, how does it allow you to take vacation and then not be worried about the loss of income? Um, and uh, how, how does it help you shield you from all these negative secular trends where you got you know, rising overhead in your practice and, you know, liability issues and declining insurance reimbursement, all these negative things. And your only solution to that is, you know, go invest more dollar cost average in the stock market. Well, right. you know, there, there are alternatives to that. And if you, you know, if you just listen to the media and read, you know, Kiplinger's and, and, and Barron's, that's, that's, that's all you know. But when you can provide an opportunity to folks you know, and bridge the gap of knowledge and, and trust um, by, you know, having someone hold your hand and kind of show you the way and actually have skin in the game who, you know, investing with you. Um, and so that all of your incentives are aligned, you know, that's that's kind of what we do at APTA is, you know, we we invest ourselves, we're the largest investors, and we and we um, educate and bring on other investors to to so that we collectively can, you know, win or lose together. And traditionally, you know, you know, knock on wood, um, we've traditionally, you know, won way more often than we've lost. Right, right. It's such a compelling discussion, if you're talking to an investor, you can have a hundred bullet points on a deal or a market. But when you say, oh, I'm the largest investor, my wife and I are the largest investor in this, kind of that goes to the top of the bullet point list and everything else becomes, you know, kind of uh, sides to, to, to on that meal. Um, it's really powerful. And I think you're right. You know, we, we kind of live and breathe this stuff, talk to investors all the time, talk to other operators all the time. But you know, what seems to be like most adults with the, any kind of financial wherewithal understand they need to be in real estate. There's a big disconnect and there's a big trust disconnect, like you said. Um, and, the, you know, the amount of folks that have investable capital and are investing in things like stock market or whatever the case is. Um, I mean, the, the amount of those folks that could and have the wherewithal to invest, let's say, in an L, uh, LP position, a multifamily deal, it's a tiny, tiny, tiny piece of kind of the total market of, of people that could. So a lot of times just kind of connecting the dots with those folks. Um, what do you guys look at in terms of, in terms of a deal profile? You mentioned being risk averse. You mentioned, you know, you kind of done different asset classes and multifamily seems to be a, a very safe one. So what is it, you know, what filter are you guys looking through when you're, you're looking at a potential new acquisition? Yeah, I, mean, I think as as you know, Devin. I mean, real estate's all about people, right? So you got to go where the people go, and so people are going to follow jobs and income. So we're we're big students of de demography. Uh, we're you know demographers by nature to kind of think about you know where are people moving, um, why are people moving there, and um, is it sustainable? Is it is it due to a diverse uh, job pool? Is there is the um, or is there income growth? Um, and where is the, you know, what are the components? We actually go and break down the different components of population growth, because sometimes you can be fooled into, you know, population growth because, you know, the healthcare system is, you know, more people are, um, you know, being born than they are, than they are dying or due to immigration. But we kind of drill down to, you know, where people within the country are moving through a, a figure called net domestic migration, which is essentially kind of a zero sum game across the country. So looking for, you know, MSAs, and submarkets that have good job and population growth that uh, has a diversified economy and you know basic supply demand imbalances you know where there's there's more of a demand for housing than there is a supply um and so um so naturally we're we're we're, we're in your neck of the woods you know texas is a great market it's it's, it's business friendly no state income tax. It's um, there's a lot of new jobs coming to Texas, and it's got a very diversified, you know, economic base. So we've got a couple assets in the DFW area. We've had an asset in San Antonio actually before, and in Austin, Texas, uh, and Atlanta, uh, another diversified market. Um, and we're looking in the Carolinas as well. So those are the markets that we're looking at in terms of. So we always, you know, it's, I think it's really important when you look at real estate to not you know, to go in a sequence, you know, we're trained as surgeons to kind of go from landmark to landmark. And it's the same type right. of principles that we use in, in our real estate investing is, you know, never look at a deal 
um, until you've evaluated the 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 MSA and the submarket in particular, because you know you don't want observation bias to lead you into a path to fall in love with a deal, and it could be in the totally uh, wrong MSA or submarket, and you you lose sight of the fundamentals because you you know you've lost the forest for the trees, and so. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a that's a crucial uh, point that we that that is part of our business model, um, and then on the deal specific you know areas we you know, we're as we mentioned we're very 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 conservative so we you know we don't use bridge debt um, we we use very relatively low leverage in the space we're in the fifty the last deal we did was a fifty percent LTV. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we raise all the capital on the front end for any kind of, uh, value add or, uh, CapEx expenditures that we have. Um, we've never had a cash call. Um, we've been consistent, you know, our model through from 2008 onward, uh, has, you know, distributed, uh, cash flow every quarter. Um, so, uh, and then we continue to refine our model. So we use, you know, AI and machine learning to kind of help you know, continue to refine that model. And so um, it's really about just being disciplined. I mean, disciplined and methodical uh, and um, having a good team behind you because, you know, as you know, real estate's a team sport. So you can't do it all yourself and you need to have domain experts in each of those areas. So I know that was a, uh, that was a fire hose, but um, <laughs> in broad terms, that's, that's kind of what we're about. Yeah, no, I love it. And, and I, I like all the markets that uh, that you mentioned. So I, I think it, it must be working. Um, how do you guys structure your deals? Is it just, you know, your your fixed rate agency debt and, and one class of equity shares? Is it, you know, pretty complex waterfall hurdles? How do you, is it different every deal? How do you guys, how do you guys structure that? Yeah, so we have a fund product. So a fund product allows, as I mentioned, most of our investors are not people who have a ton of real estate. There are people who have, you know, high income and who have limited amount of time and limited right. amount of knowledge or desire to really be into real estate. Because more and more peers I talk to, I mean, I, we were kind of thrust into this because we had a passion for it and other people saw that we had a passion for it. And they were like, can you help us? Because they didn't have the time or the energy or the desire to go learn this themselves. And they didn't want to, they wanted to leverage our, you know, experience uh, right. to be able to do this. So we, um, so we have a fund product that allows diversification. So across, you know, about typically about four assets per fund. So, um, and um, that allows, you know, the average stock and bond investor to kind of get their feet wet into, into multifamily. So we typically uh, on our current fund, we have just one, one share uh, of at one asset class of, of share class. Um, mm-hmm. I think in the future, we're probably going to have more than that because I think there are some people who are more yield sensitive um, yes. and want consistent cash flow. Some people want, you know, uh, long-term equity growth. We haven't gotten super complex, and in terms of waterfalls, we have you know a simple eight eight percent pref, and you know we're um, we're an eighty twenty um, uh, split after that eight uh, percent pref. So um, we're we're trying to be as investor friendly as possible because again, this is this is um, you know we're running a business, um, but you know this is a business of, of passion, um, not out of financial necessity for us. We sure. we're doing this because we love what we do and not because we need to. So. Um, you know, we 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 want to make the economics as beneficial as possible for our investors while still being able to keep our lights on. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And the the fund is equity, right? I mean, that's that's all. So you you know, you're passing depreciation through to to your LPs, things like that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Everything's you know fractional ownership, uh, so everything goes through Parapasu. Yeah, that's really nice. Um, nice to be diver- diversified among a handful of assets, not a, not a million, you know, but a, a few at a time. So you can kind of launch a fund, deploy that, and then maybe look at getting into another fund. Is that how you guys approach it? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's great. I like it. Um, so let's talk about, you know, kind of the, the team you, you mentioned it was a team sport. Actually, you know what, I want to get to that, but I want to get something else you said about the 50% LTV range, right? We're talking in Q4 of 2022, since about mid year rates have gone very high, uh, leverage has gone very low, not as many deals transacting as, as we saw, you know, last year, maybe the first quarter of this year, but seems almost like an advantage or a secret weapon. If you're already accustomed to low leverage, um, bringing a lot of equity to a deal, 
you know, how, how is that, has that helped you guys in this current environment? Have you always done it that way? What's your approach there to debt? Because that's a huge component in today's market, right? Yeah, I think, you know, debt and leverage, Devin, is kind of a two-edged sword, right? Because, I mean, you mm -hmm. want to be able to accentuate your returns and improve your yields. Uh, and so you take on leverage. Um, on the on the flip side, you know, um, in in if you're overly levered, you know, you don't want to, you've got a higher risk of having cash calls. And, you know, if your business plan doesn't go exactly as you, as you think, you don't want to be underwater. So, um, you know, we've always been in that six, 50 to 65% range. Um, and so, so yes, you're right. The current, you know, <laughs> you know, debt to equity ratios aren't a huge surprise to us. The, the, the right. challenge we're having is, you know, quite honestly, is the rates have gone up. And so, you know, you've seen, you've seen rates go up and you haven't seen uh cap rate expansion um, commensurate with that. So I think there's still a little bit of a mismatch between, you know, sellers expectations and, and, and buyers uh, requirements of, uh, right. of, of equity. So um, that's been a little bit of a challenge, but, you know, we've, you know, the last deal we did, we did, um, you know, traditionally we've done Fannie and Freddie debt, but we, we actually found that life insurance companies, are less sensitive to um, you know the lending uh, the 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 rising rates than than some of the GSE lenders. So we we got a fixed rate debt from um, from uh, MetLife on our last deal that was very attractive at four and a half percent. So um, six to five years. And so, um, but you're right. And looking at the deals right now, I mean it's it, it's hard to pencil things out. And I think we're our expectations are a little bit lower on on terms of yield. I think sure. you know because of the um, the high the higher rates, you know, you're going to, you're going to see a drop in yields. But I think, you know, because we're in an inflationary time period, uh, I think the long-term returns are going to be pretty stable. We're, you know, we do traditionally, you know, we aim for the mid teens um, in terms of returns and in bull markets, we're in the twenties, um, but in bear markets, we're still in the low teens. So um, our standard deviation is, 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 is compressed relative to any other type of investment vehicle. So I think what you're seeing right now is that you're going to see more of the return in terms of the long-term equity growth and, and, and less yield. So um, still compelling relative from, a, especially from a tax advantage perspective compared to um, other alternatives. Uh, for cash flow, but um, I, I think that's just something that investors are going to have to get used to. It's just the changing environment. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yields are certainly there's there's downward pressure on those, um, and it, it it's easy to you know we we play in the real estate world, and it's easy to say oh we got twenty five IRR in this last deal, and gosh you know a mid teens low teens IRR feels bad, but compared to some of the alternatives, right? Compared to what stock markets doing compared to what FTX just did last week and, you know, took down, <laughs> basically dissolved billions of dollars of, of capital and, yeah. and things like yeah. that. Real estate is a pretty, you know, darn safe kind of middle of the fairway bet where you're, you're not going to hundred X or 10 X your money, but you're likely not going to lose it either, which you keep, you keep making those bets over time. That's going to, that's going to stack up very meaningfully. Well, I'm sure you have this conversation a lot, but curious to kind of get your perspective on it. When you've got that maybe new introduction to your firm, you got that physician or that professional that's trying to dip their toe in the water. What is your conversation like with, with that person? You know, maybe they've heard of real estate, but they, they haven't done it, haven't crossed over that threshold and, but they're interested and they, they want to kind of see how it works. What, what do you tell that person? Well, I think the the first thing to kind of just use some common sense principles of like, you know, what what do people need? If you think of kind of the base layer of Maslow's, you know, hierarchy of needs, sure. you know, um, housing is one of those, right? And so, you know, you think about all the technological revolutions that we've had and all the changes that we've had, you know, it's just it's just very unlikely that Elon Musk is gonna, you know, usurp the need for a bedroom and a kitchen and a bathroom, right? Right. And so, you know, if you can put a large percentage of your money or at least a significant sizable percentage of your investable assets in things that are not likely to change, especially when you study demographic trends and you know where people are going and you know where there's a supply demand imbalance that cannot easily be caught up, it, it makes sense, right? And so I, I think people got to people have to think about this just from a very common sense standpoint. Even if you know nothing about real estate, you you know a little bit about you know, human nature and human needs. 
And so, um, you know, the, our, our, our thought process is just to, just a basic education of like invest in stuff that is, is real. Um, you know, people think, you know, the only thing option is the stock market, but, you know, people have been investing in real estate for centuries, way before right. the stock market was ever around. Right. And if, you know, if you look at the Forbes 400, I mean, you know, people either made their money, all these billionaires made their money through real estate, or they're at least preserving their money and, and, and creating a, a platform for generational wealth uh, through real estate. Um, the other thing to look at is the IRS tax code. I mean, what is the government incentivizing? You know, people think of uh, the tax code as all these things that they can't do. <clears throat> but, you know, as uh, I, I follow Tom Wheelwright quite a bit, and he, he, he kind of flips the script on that. He's like, think of the tax code as you know, what the government is incentivizing you to do, right? Absolutely. So real estate is, you know, that is very, very consistently been very high on that list, not just in the United States, but in, you know, all other industrialized countries. So I, I think that's the perspective to kind of think about. And then, you know, the other key thing that I kind of go over with investors is that diversification is super, super important. Everybody, every financial professional tells you about diversification. Um, but they, you know, a lot of love, the typical approach is diversify across various uh, asset classes within stocks or bonds. Um, well, why not do that same across different asset classes that are not correlated to the stock market? Um, you know, I point investors to uh, Tiger 21, which is a, you know, a, a, um, a $10 million plus high net worth group of institutions, uh, institutional, um, it's not institutions, but individuals. Um, sure. And, you know, they've got they've done their surveys of, of people, you know, who have $10 million plus to invest and the plurality of their investments are in real estate. They're very well diversified, but there's their data shows that, you know, 27 percent of their of their investable assets are invested in real estate and like 25 percent in stocks. So um, that that ought to tell you something. If the four four hundred is doing something, these people that, you know, a lot of these physicians are aspiring to be in that you know, Tiger 21 kind of echelon uh, of and of a portfolio, success leaves clues, right? So, you know, you can always kind of look to see what other people who are very successful have done and, and how can you implement those into your own investing profile. So, um, so that those are some of the things we talk about in terms of why real estate. But I think even before that, a lot of this comes down to mindset. Like, what are you trying to accomplish? You know, right. what, what can make your life better? Do you want, I mean, we talk about investing and all this other stuff, but really, I mean, I think you got to go down to like, why are you doing this? You know, what do you want to do? Do you want to, do you want to travel the world? Do you want to donate to your favorite charities? Do you want to get out of medicine. I mean, unfortunately, a lot of uh, our peers don't want to practice medicine, but they practice medicine for a paycheck. And for those right. folks, this is a way to get out of medicine. And for the people who want to continue to practice medicine, they will love it a whole lot more if they didn't really have to. And so we provide those opportunities. Real estate, multifamily real estate just happens to be um, the tool to accomplish whatever it is you're trying to accomplish, uh, whatever it is your passion is. So um, I kind of go back to an analogy, you know, you know, you, you, you go to Home Depot and you ask for a drill bit and, you know, real estate's our drill bit, but you're really not after the drill bit. You're, you're trying to make a hole, right? right. And so, <laughs> so we try to find out what their hole is and see if, uh, you know, see if real estate is, is their drill bit or not, you know? So th that's kind of our, our, our thought process. I love it. Yes, yeah, so, so much good stuff there. And I think it's a, a very powerful thesis that's um, proven over time, relatively easy to kind of convey to somebody that's new to it. A lot of good stuff there. Looking ahead, you know, we're, we're coming into 2023 here. What what do you guys see for the year ahead in terms of, uh, uh, you know, your, your company's plans and vision? And then maybe, uh, you know, maybe throw some guesses out there with your with your crystal ball for what you see in the year ahead. Yeah, you know, the, the, the thing is, you know, <laughs> I've heard totally unfair that, question. You, you, you write down you write down your predictions for the future and then you and then you you go back and check yourself and you realize how inaccurate uh you can be. And but the good news behind that is that it doesn't matter if it's if it's Devin or Vasu telling you that or or if you're um some you know uh, pundit on TV. We we're all equally wrong. Yes. <laughs> I love it. Yep. Um, so it's very, very hard to kind of predict what, what's going to happen. But I think, you know, Jerome Prowl has, 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 
has a lot of control right now. And, you know, we'll, we'll find out if they're able to continue to, uh, to, to raise rates. I personally, I mean, my, my guess is that the Fed is going to continue to try and, and, and keep rates high. Um, but I think there's going to be a lot of consequences to that, especially mm-hmm. as we head into the next election cycle. And, um, you know, you see, you know, rising rates can, 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 can cause a snowball effect, even outside the United States, you've seen, you know, other currencies start to collapse outside the United States. And, you know, it's a global economy, even though we're, we're moving towards this trend towards the nationalism. I think there's some consequences of, of what the Fed does that, that, that transcend just the U.S. borders. So, um, I, I think there's going to be another, uh, you know, you're going to see some rise for the next probably quarter or two, but I, I think it's going to plateau. And I think you're going to see some uh, reduction if, as the economy slows down. Um, and so, you know, no one knows the future. So, so then what do you do as an average investor? So my, my thesis is that, you know, you stick to the fundamentals, right? We talked about right. that earlier. Um, yep. so, and if you're a long-term holder, um, you can typically ride out these waves. And so, especially if you apply some financial discipline uh, to your long-term thesis, um, you know, you should be well protected. I, I, you know, I was, I was in real estate in 2007 and eight when everything crashed. And I, you know, you study the guys that were really went under, mm-hmm. they were the guys who were overly levered. Sure. Or didn't have financial discipline and had assumptions that were astronomical or based upon the previous few years and not uh, not forward looking for a, a downturn. So I think if you underwrite right now for a downturn, you're not overly levered and you you have enough dry powder to last. Um, you will you you get into trouble. I think when you when you're forced to liquidate during a down yes. cycle, right? That's right. But, if you can ride out a down cycle because you've got enough dry powder, you've used the financial discipline, you write it out and then you can, you can transact, you know, when the market's better. So, um, so the, I guess the take home message, uh, Devin is, I don't know any more than anybody else knows, <laughs> but I do know that you got to stick to the fundamentals and that's been tried and true through various economic cycles. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate your perspective on that and, and, and totally agree. And, Historically, these these periods are, you know, the gray bars uh, are relatively short versus the, you know, the, the, the longer expansive periods or the periods that were not in a recession. Um, well, I really appreciate your perspective on the on the business, on your journey, on what you're doing for investors. If somebody wants to connect with you and your company, how do they do that? Yeah, so we recorded a, a webinar for folks to kind of get a, get their feet wet and learn a little bit about what we do. It's just at afterproperties.com uh, forward slash webinar. Uh, and it's I think it's a good place for people to start. And if they're interested, they can connect with uh, us on um, our website or LinkedIn um, is a good place to connect. Perfect. Well, we'll link to the webinar link that you just shared in the show notes. So if you're listening, you can just scroll through the brief description and click straight through and register for that. Uh, Vasu, it was Absolute pleasure getting to chat with you today. I wish you guys uh, success in the year ahead. Yeah, likewise, Devin. It was a pleasure to talk to you. All right, take care. Thank you for listening to the DJE Podcast. For more information, please go to djetexas.com.